Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Janet Jalil and in the early hours of Thursday, the 3rd of November, these are our main stories. The Ethiopian government and Tigrayan rebels have signed an agreement it's hoped will end two years of devastating civil war. A court in the U.S. state of Florida has sentenced the gunman responsible for the 2018 Parkland school massacre to life in prison without parole. The first person ever to vote in an independent India has cast his ballot again at the age of 105. Also in this piece, band AHA helped to protect the environment by promoting electric cars. In the two years since it broke out, the civil war in Ethiopia has left thousands dead millions displaced and hundreds of thousands of people facing famine. But in a dramatic diplomatic breakthrough that took many observers by surprise, the government and the Tigrayan rebels have agreed to a permanent end to hostilities. Formal talks had begun last week in South Africa. The Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, described the ceasefire agreement as a monumental step forward. The UN Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Hanna Serwa Tete, called it an opportunity to chart a new course. The young men and women who have been mobilized to fight will now have the chance to return to their homes and their families. They will not have to live with the fear that this day could be their last. We as observers commit to support the implementation of this agreement. The humanitarian response in the first instance And we are also ready to accompany this process of providing support and assistance in all three regions of northern Ethiopia that have been affected by the conflict. Our Africa regional editor, Will Ross, told us more about what the two sides had agreed. They have agreed to a permanent ceasefire, silencing the guns they talked about today. That is is a huge step, bearing in mind just how bad the fighting has become in recent weeks. They've agreed to a a number of things which I think many people will believe has sort of gone further than what was expected. So just to give you an example, when they were reading out the joint communique, the representative of the Ethiopian government said that both sides have agreed that there's only one national defence force in Ethiopia and they've agreed to a programme of disarmament, demobilisation and reintegration for the TPLF combatants. So the Tigrayan fighters, as it were, would give up their arms. That is a huge step and somewhat surprising. There's other things that were mentioned in the communique. We're talking about an agreement to allow in humanitarian aid. And also they've talked about restoring constitutional order in Tigray and rebuilding communities that have been shattered by this war. But there are still many, many steps to go through. And it was interesting that the African Union facilitator of the dialogue, the former Nigerian president, Olushagun Abasanjo, just said this was the beginning of the peace process. As you say, a long way to go, but still a dramatic and, as you said before, a surprising breakthrough. Any idea what's led to this, given that the conflict has been so intense and devastating over the past two years? I think a number of factors. One will be pretty intense international pressure on both sides to end the fighting, which has just caused such devastation station in Ethiopia. On top of that, it's been pretty clear in recent weeks that the pro-government forces, and that includes the Ethiopian military, some regional military forces from neighbouring regions of the country, as well as fighters from across the border in Eritrea, they've been in the ascendancy and have taken back areas. And I think it's fair to say that the Tigrayan forces have been under increasingly intense pressure. So, you know, perhaps if the fighting hadn't got this bad from the TPLF's point of view, they may not have agreed to those concessions, including, you know, giving up their arms. So it's a combination of factors. Um, But, you know, many people will say, you know, there's still clearly a huge amount of mistrust between the two sides. And one of the key things is I mentioned Eritrea 
is deeply involved in this war. It wasn't at these peace talks. It hasn't taken part in the dialogue. And it's clearly bitterly opposed to the TPLF still. And, you know, we're going to have to see whether the Eritrean authorities are happy just to say, OK, you've signed a deal. We will also stop fighting and make sure that uh, Ethiopia becomes a peaceful country. Will Ross, two of America's biggest pharmacy chains have agreed in principle to pay about $5 billion each to resolve all opioid lawsuits brought by state, local and tribal governments across the country. CVS and Walgreens said they'd reached deals to settle the claims against them over the next 10 to 15 years, but that the agreements did not admit wrongdoing. Both firms have been accused of fulfilling prescriptions for powerful and addictive opioid painkillers that should have been flagged as inappropriate. A third company, Walmart, is reported to have reached a similar agreement but has not confirmed this itself. Rahul Tandon spoke to Barry Meyer, the author of Painkiller, An Empire of Deceit and the Origin of America's Opioid Epidemic. The opioid crisis in the United States ranks as among, if not the top, public health disasters in this country. Last year, over 100,000 people, Americans, died in opioid-related overdose deaths. It's a problem that's still continuing. We've had this settlement from two of the U.S.'s largest pharmacies. How significant is that? It's a very major settlement, both in terms of the amount of money and the size of the drug change. There's Walgreens and CVS, which are the two major drug chains here in the United States. These are the largest single settlement offers being made by pharmacies. Here it seems that the companies are settling because they're accused of not doing enough, these pharmacies, to stem the flow of pills into communities of opioids. But they're not accepting responsibility, are they? Well, this is quite commonplace in the U.S. legal system where, you know, people suing a company will make various claims based on documentation they've obtained during the legal process showing that these companies allegedly acted in illegal, corrupt, unethical, you name it, kinds of manner. But in the course of negotiating these settlements, it's almost inevitable that the companies will require there to be a clause in the settlement that they do not acknowledge wrongdoing. And that is the price that the plaintiffs are willing to pay to get the money. Are we coming to the end of the legal process, whether it's against the pharmacies, whether it's against the drug companies, or do you expect to see many more cases coming to court? That's a good point, because I think we're now starting to see this wrapped up, if you will. Most of the drug chains now have agreed to settlements. Most of the manufacturers have agreed to settlements. These are the major players and the most deep-pocketed players. This is a, a tragedy on a huge scale. With the current system in the U.S., could this happen again? Of course. I mean, a drug like OxyContin could get approved again. Mistakes could be made again. I I think that one of the things we need to bear in mind, you know, when I wrote Painkiller, which told the story of OxyContin and the illegal marketing of that drug, that was 20 years ago. And it's taken us 20 years to get to the point of some kind of resolution. And, And to me, the frightening thing is that if a problem like this does arise again, and there's no reason to think it won't, we may go through the same 20-year cycle. Barry Meyer, the author of Painkiller, An Empire of Deceit and the Origin of America's Opioid Epidemic. It's the deadliest mass shooting to reach a jury trial in the United States. It occurred at a high school in the city of Parkland in the state of Florida, where in 2018, Nicholas Cruz shot dead 17 students and staff. On Wednesday, a judge sentenced him to life in prison without parole. A jury voted last month to spare Cruz from the death penalty. 
That decision enraged the relatives of his victims, who denounced the criminal justice system for saving his life when he'd taken those of so many others. As they got their one chance to address him directly in court ahead of his sentencing, the relatives spoke of their fury and their grief. This entire ordeal has pushed me to my emotional, physical and mental limits. It will continue to do so for the rest of my life, even more so now, knowing he gets to live out the rest of his natural life, something Elena doesn't get to do. I wish no peace for you, and I hope that every breath you take, you remember that that's a breath you stole. You stole Chris from us. The voices of Megan Kelly, who lost her younger sister, and Inez Hickson, the daughter-in-law of another victim. There were so many who wanted to speak that the testimonies, which started on Tuesday, carried on well into Wednesday. Our correspondent, Nomia Iqbal, has been following the story from Washington. They all wanted Nicholas Cruz to get the death penalty, and what you heard there from Miss Kelly is similar to what all the families have been saying. They have criticised him. They've been very direct in what they have said to him in court. They've been critical of the jury, the defence. That's led to some criticism by the prosecution that it's unfair that the the family have reacted that way, particularly to the defence, given they say that they were just doing their jobs. There have been so many shootings in the US, but just remind us of the impact of this particular one. Well, what happened that day on Valentine's Day in 2018 was sadly familiar. Gunmen walking into school, shooting people dead. But then something unfamiliar happened. State legislators started passing legislation to restrict gun access. And that's because the students that survived in Parkland started this huge movement that sparked huge success for the gun control movement. So there were laws restricting access to guns, ranging from banning bump stocks, allowing authorities to temporarily disarm potentially violent people. But then, since then, many states have loosened gun laws, and it's still this really contentious debate, as we know, that happens at the federal and state level. You've got Americans who believe that they have the right to keep and bear arms enshrined in the Constitution, while there are others that argue that any gun control measures, they save lives and they don't infringe citizen rights. So it's still very much an ongoing issue in this country, as we know. Nomia Iqbal. In Iran, seven weeks on, the protests over the death in police custody of Masa Amini show no sign of abating. Many people, angered by the security forces' increasingly brutal crackdown, took to the streets of cities across Iran. Masa Amini's home province of Kurdistan was a particular flashpoint. Our Middle East regional editor, Mike Thompson, reports. Protesters in the city of Sanandaj, capital of Kurdistan province, set fire to tyres and litter bins, blocked roads and chanted slogans against the country's supreme leader. Demonstrators also took to the streets of Marivan, where students had running battles with security forces. Elsewhere, chanting mourners gathered at a cemetery in Nosha, north of Tehran, to mark the 40-day anniversary of the death of a protester. In Shiraz, students staged a sit-in to demand the release of arrested classmates, and there were further protests in the southeastern city of Zahedan. Mike Thompson. A bishop in Ireland has apologised after members of a congregation walked out of a sermon because of derogatory comments by the Catholic priest delivering it. Father Sean Sheehy condemned abortion, same-sex marriage and transgender people. But the bishop said the priest's comments did not represent the Christian position. Here's our Ireland correspondent, Emma Vardy. Father Sean Sheehy, who's retired, was standing in for the usual parish priest at St Mary's in Listowel when he delivered his homily. During the service, which was streamed live, he told the congregation that sexual sin was rampant in society. We see it in the promotion of abortion. We see it for exa- in, the, in the example of this lunatic approach of transgenderism. We see it, for example, in the promotion of sex between two men or two women. That is sinful. That is mortal sin. Father Sheehy went on to say that free condoms provided to young people by the health service was promoting promiscuity. He then called on people to repent. A number of the congregation stood up and walked out of the service. In a statement on the diocese website, the Bishop of Kerry apologised, saying that the regular parish mass was not appropriate for such issues to be spoken of and that the priest's views did not represent the Christian position. But speaking later on Radio Kerry, 
Father Sheehy stood by his comments, saying despite the anger, others had thanked him after the sermon and that he was reflecting the views of many Catholics. Dell O'Sullivan, who was in the congregation, told Radio Kerry's Jerry O'Sullivan why she decided to leave. As it went on, it got steadily worse. After about 10 minutes, when he reached the point of being very hurtful to people we love in our society, gay people and transgender people, and he started to speak very wrongly about them, I just said, enough is enough. It's understood that the Bishop of Kerry has told Father Sheehy that he is to be removed from the roster for conducting Mass. That report by Emma Vardy. Still to come? Reconfirmed our joint pledge to make this next major tournament fully carbon neutral. The football's governing body, FIFA, is facing calls to stop describing the forthcoming World Cup in Qatar as carbon neutral. Wednesday, the 2nd of November, was the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. The day recognised the dangers that many face while trying to report on the world around them and called on governments to do more to protect journalists and their right to work safely. One of the most dangerous countries to operate in is Somalia. As many as 54 journalists have lost their lives reporting there in the last decade alone. Here's one of BBC Africa's journalists to tell us of her own experience as a correspondent in Mogadishu. My name is Bella Shigo and I'm a journalist at BBC Africa. Working in Mogadishu was one of the most difficult things that I've ever done in my whole life. It was like living in a constant fear while trying to do your job. As a journalist, it's your job to tell the truth, but sometimes that's really very difficult because you are under a danger from different sites and that makes you feel so unsafe. You think about at the back of your head, oh, who's going to be angry about this or will this going to affect me? Or sometimes you ask yourself, oh, is this going to be the last thing that I'm going to do? So yeah, for me, that is the kind of experience that I have been through. There was a couple of times that I felt that my life was in danger because of some stories that I've done. And the most recent one that I remember was in 2021, when I was working on a story about a female spy agent who got killed. Some of the government officials really got mad and they were not happy with the things that we were saying and that really put my life in danger. And at some point I was really very afraid and I remember at nights I used to wake up and think about the woman who died. She was like me. She was a working woman and she died because of what she was doing. And that could have happened to me too. And we have Al-Shabaab, they don't like us. They kill journalists wherever they see them. And we have the government in another side. They only like you when you say the good things that they do and start hating you when you start telling the truth, like when you hold them accountable. They don't like that. And they're dangerous too. And we have the community and the people. It's very tricky because they themselves, they have been through a lot, so they don't trust anyone. So recently, I've lost a good friend of mine who was also a great journalist. He has done an amazing job while he was working in Mogadishu, and his stories have changed a lot of people's lives. It was only over the weekend when I received a call from Mogadishu about someone telling me that he died in a blast. It was really very difficult to hear something like that because we've been working together for a long time and I did not just see him as a journalist. He was someone who changed lives.
Bella Shigo ending that report with a tribute to her friend and fellow journalist Mohammed Isi Kona. He was one of the victims of last Saturday's bomb attacks in Mogadishu that claimed more than 120 lives. UN officials have warned that climate change is fueling global health crises, including rising cases of disease and potential famine. The World Health Organization says warmer temperatures and increased flooding are leading to more cholera, malaria and dengue fever. This follows a similar warning from scientists published in the Lancet Medical Journal last month. Imogen Folks reports. Climate change is making us sick. The WHO has recorded at least 26 cholera outbreaks this year, more than the previous five years combined. Successive droughts in the Horn of Africa cause crops to fail and livestock to die. Aid agencies believe famine in Somalia is now imminent. Longer term, studies suggest global warming will subject parts of Africa to such extreme heat that human life will become unsustainable. Imogen, folks. Fifteen Nobel Prize winners are calling on the host of the COP27 climate summit, Egypt, to release thousands of political prisoners, including the writer Ala Abdel Fattah. The British Egyptian activist was a major figure in the 2011 Arab Spring revolt that toppled the longtime Egyptian president Hosni Mubarak. And he's been on hunger strike for more than 200 days, taking in just 100 calories a day. On Tuesday, he began refusing all food and has threatened to stop drinking water as well. Here's our diplomatic correspondent, Caroline Hawley. Human rights groups say that tens of thousands of political prisoners are held in Egypt's jails. Most prominent among them is Ala Abdel Fattah, a 40-year-old who's been imprisoned for most of the past decade. His family say that he's now only drinking water and plans to stop even that on Sunday, the first day of the climate summit. The Nobel Prize winners say that he's at risk of death, his powerful voice for democracy close to being extinguished. They're asking dignitaries attending COP27 to use the opportunity to help those imprisoned and forgotten in the host country, as well, they say, as those vulnerable to the rising seas. Caroline Hawley. A 105-year-old man who cast the first vote in India's first ever post-independence election more than 70 years ago is being celebrated as he carries out his democratic duty for the 34th time. Shyam Saranegi, a retired school teacher, was serenaded by musicians and hailed by election officials as he submitted a postal vote in assembly elections in the northern region of Himachal Pradesh. Sanjay Dasgupta has more. After independence, India's first election was held in 1952, February 1952. But because that part of India, that district is so high in the Himalayas and in February it gets snowbound, voters in that district and a few other districts were allowed to vote about four months beforehand in October 1951. And this is when Mr. Negi turned out to vote. And he happened to be, just happened to be the first one in the queue to cast his vote. And this is why he is now India's first ever voter in the first ever general election. And he was living his humdrum life till an election officer in 2007 actually looked at the records and found that he was the, had been the first person to vote in India's first general election. Ever since then, he's become a sort of a celebrity. Every time he goes out and votes, there is coverage a few television cameras this time, probably because he's 105 now, and this is his 34th election vote, he says. There's been quite a big ceremony. A red carpet was laid at his doorstep, a band played, and the election commission people actually made sure that they went to his doorstep to get his vote in, rather than him coming to the polling booth. I think he's earned that. Uh, Sanjay Desgupta reporting there. With just under two weeks to go before the Football World Cup in Qatar, the sports world governing body, FIFA, is facing calls to stop describing the tournament as carbon neutral. Sporting and environmental groups across Europe have lodged complaints, arguing the claim is based on false information. It's predicted that the World Cup will produce more than 3.5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide, but officials say they've taken steps to offset emissions by investing in green projects. Our sports news reporter, Alex Capstick, has the details. Reconfirmed. 
our joint pledge to make this next major tournament fully carbon neutral. A video message delivered by Gianni Infantino, the president of FIFA at last year's COP26 in Glasgow, promising a net zero World Cup. But climate change experts claim FIFA's predicted carbon emissions have been grossly underestimated and that the methods for offsetting don't stack up. The critics include a group of professional footballers from across Europe. The BBC has seen an open letter signed by them in which they argue pledges of a super green World Cup are being used in a bid to deflect attention away from criticism of alleged human rights violations in Qatar. Norway's Morten Thorsby, who plays for the German league leaders Union Berlin, says there should be more focus on the flawed nature of FIFA's sustainability strategy. You know, the human rights aspect has been taking you know, all the headlines because that's been a terrible, terrible part of this World Cup. The environmental impact side of it hasn't been that much headline. doesn't mean it's less important. You know, this tournament is an absolute disaster in terms of also its environmental footprint. In a coordinated move, environmental groups in five countries, including the UK, have contacted their relevant advertising standard agencies, protesting that FIFA's claim is misleading to fans and players alike. In response, FIFA said it was committed to delivering a fully carbon-neutral World Cup and defended the way the tournament's footprint has been assessed. Alex Capstick. Now, staying with the environment, let's take you back to the night about purposely racking up traffic violations and fines, campaigning for the government to grant incentives to electric vehicle drivers. Now, more than 30 years on, Norway is a world leader in electric vehicle use. AHA's lead singer, Morten Harkett, told the BBC what inspired him in those early days to rack up fines in his electric car. I didn't feel I was entering into the role of a rebel, really. I, I, I realised that that's what it was, but it was just necessary. It was what we needed to do, and it made just made every sense, you know. It, it did cause reactions. Uh, we got the media response, but but, but obviously we we couldn't know uh, how far that would take us, or or. For that sake, what consequences it would have for us. But that didn't really matter because we've, we strongly felt that we were doing what we needed to do. AHA's lead singer and early electric car adopter, Morton Harkett. And that's all from us for now, but there will be a new edition of the Global News podcast later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. You can also find us on Twitter at Global News Pod. This edition was mixed by Philip Bull. The producer was Liam McSheffrey. The editor is Karen Martin. I'm Jeanette Jalil. Until next time. Goodbye. A black sports star the world ignored. She was the Michael Jordan of women's basketball. Someone who played two sports at the highest level. Possibly the best female athlete in the country. A champion at both tennis and basketball at a time of racial segregation in the United States. She was dealing with a more difficult era. It's not an accident. People weren't paying enough attention to her. Untold Legends, the podcast from the BBC World Service and BBC Sounds, tells the story of Aura Washington, the queen of two courts who never got the opportunities and recognition she deserved this is nothing short of a hidden figure story it's about time the world knows her name you can download and listen to all episodes of aura's story now just search for untold legends wherever you found this podcast <laughs>